Record on this computer. Thank you. Got it. And somebody just popped in. Hang on. That's Steve. Yeah. And um, let me now just pause this. Uh, we and you do the that. We are resuming. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I don't know how many people are going to show up. We'll let them in. I've got that all set up so they can just get in anytime they want. Uh, so uh, as everybody knows, uh, Tana Talk is a journey of discovery about all things Antana. And then, of course, this, uh, this week, we are going to be talking about podcast number eight or um, YouTube number eight for Software Defined Radio and Diversity Receive uh, mode. And uh, I, I will have to admit, Rudy, I think that was one of your best uh, YouTubes you've done. It was really? nice, clear, concise, and very well presented. So uh, I was very proud of you, Rudy. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting yeah, there better you go. This. Yeah, right. Sure. Uh, but anyway, I enjoyed it. So, uh, um, which, uh, and, and it made it simple enough to run. So, Tenet Talk is a production of the Antenna Whisper, Rudy Wiedemann, K7RAW. And it's support and sponsored by the Las Vegas Radio Amateur Club. So, on that note, uh, K7RAW, the stage is yours. Well, thanks, Charlie. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks for coming. Oh, there's Craig. Yeah. So good. Hey, Craig. So, uh, Tenet Talk uh, this this month is on SDR and diversity mode. So, Craig, did you see the the video of the same title? I have not. We've been traveling. We were representing Alaska at the uh, National Professional en Engineers Convention, and okay. just got back. We're between conventions. We're going to another one in DC here, uh, leaving tomorrow night. So uh, we'll just take okay. it from the top. All right. Well. Uh, well, I'm not going to really, uh, for those who've seen it, I'm not going to really go through the whole thing for you, uh, but uh, I'll just give you kind of a couple of the highlights and go quickly and go into the Q&A portion. And then I want to save a little bit of time, Charlie, at the end for a special uh, appendix to that okay. presentation that I put together this afternoon that talks about where is this all taking us in the future of ham radio? And it's oh. my vision of the future of ham radio. And it's uh, kind of fun. And I'll, it'll hopefully will we'll spark some ideas. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, this little slideshow and give the screen to you. Oh, okay, great. So um, basically, what is, what's diversity mode, right? Diversity mode is where you kind of separate your receive side of your your radio operations from your transmit side. Why would we want to do that? Uh, well, very often your transmit antenna may not be the best receive antenna. It may not be long enough, may not be high enough. Uh, it might be compromised like a mobile antenna or something. Uh, we all know about compromised antennas. So uh, you don't have, often have to do that with the receive side. You can put up a very, very thin wire, a long wire and uh, Remember that received signals are based on the length because you're actually picking up volts per meter. That's the electric field is actually in volts per meter. The more meters of wire you have out there, the more millivolts you get, the stronger the signal you'll receive and the better you'll be able to pull out those weak signals. So uh, that's the whole concept of it. Now, you want to be careful how you set that up because you want to make sure that you don't put your power into your receive antenna and the receiver that that receive antenna is hooked to, like an SDR radio. So you want to have something like a manual switch, a TR switch, or uh, some other uh, kind of a situation. Or another strategy is something I do uh, with my K7RAW vertical. I actually extend it to full length even though it's much, much longer than it might need to be on things like the higher wavelength, uh, higher frequencies, like 15 meters and 10 meters. But that gives it better receive. And then you say, well, how do you get deal with the transmit side? I put an auto tuner on the bottom. And it turns out 
that if the, the longer that antenna is, the easier it is for the auto tuner to accommodate a longer whip antenna and find the right LC combination to make the an integer number of um, current nodes, standing waves on that antenna at the frequency that you're tuning up on uh, and, and operate and then radiate. So uh, don't be afraid of having a long whip antenna to get that receive signal even though it's longer than you want, maybe a lot longer than you want, if you've got a, a, an auto tuner at the base of that antenna. So uh, that's another way to deploy receive uh, uh, or a a kind of form of diversity mode, but it's not really diversity mode. It's really more receive enhanced or re more receive preferable than a pure transmitting antenna. Because very often our, trans our antennas that are tuned strictly for transmitting can work. But like I said, they don't always give you the best received performance. So that's a little bit about diversity received and why we want to consider diversity received. So that goes hand in hand with software defined radios. So, so SDRs are really cool. They started off by utilizing actually a TV decoder chip. And uh, I forgot the, the number of it is 2810 or something like that, 2832. Uh, but it's it's a little chip that was designed for TV decoder demodulation. So it can take an RF signal, it can downsample it, do some digital processing, and give you a baseband output. The I won't go into the I and Q signals and quadrature and all that stuff. That's really uh, uh, too much too complex to get into it now. But the bottom line is this. With a small radio, like an SDR radio, as small as a, as a flash drive, uh, the original ones that they sold, and they still sell them today, it's called an RTL SDR, 25 bucks, uh, and it looks like a flash drive. You have an SMA connector on one end, you got a USB connector on the other end. You hook up your antenna to, S, to the uh, SMA, you plug it into your computer, and you've got a broadband receiver. Now, what this does is it opens you up to this huge world of software that gives you all kinds of capabilities. And uh, what I'll do for those of you who haven't, the one thing I will do for those of you who haven't seen the, uh, the latest video is I'll give you a image snapshot here. Charlie, if you can let me share the screen, please. Charlie? It's all yours. Okay, thank you. All right. So can you all see that? Give it a second. There we go. You got it. Okay. So uh, this is a snapshot of SDR console. Uh, there's a number of uh, pretty good free SDR software packages out there that runs on uh, Windows, uh, Mac and Linux, uh, all three operating systems. And uh, once you <laughs> once you actually get your feet wet and figure out how to navigate around in these things, it's pretty darn powerful. I find what's really cool, for example, is you can see on the better SDRs, not so much the RTL SDRs. That's a that's a beginner's uh, uh, device. It's good to get your feet wet, but not really go swimming. Um, something like the SDR Play RSP1A, which is what I have, uh, has enough bit depth and enough bandwidth to give you the entire band in one screen. Uh, and then you can actually set for the sideband portion, for example, you can set the, uh, the step size for one kilohertz. And almost everybody today is on one kilohertz uh, intervals between transmissions. You just literally click on the stripe, the waterfall stripe underneath the spectrum scope, you click on the middle of that waterfall stripe and bang, you are automatically on frequency and you're you're listening to them. And if they're calling CQ, you hit them back. So it's point and shoot communication. And uh, it's it's wonderful. You can synchronize this with your with pretty much any radio that has cat control. Uh, it's uh, fairly straightforward now. Uh, you can set preferences. You've got, and this SDR radios are, are 
darn near DC to daylight. They started like 50 to 100 kilohertz, and they work up to gigahertz type frequencies. So it's amazing. You see on the left here, uh, this little window is giving you the audio uh, spectrum scope. Uh, then you have all the modes below that. Then you have different filters, um, bandpass filters down below this. Well, that's just a tiny, tiny sampling. There's plugins. There's all kinds of features and functions for these SDR software packages. Uh, and each one has a different style of giving it to you, a uh, different set of tools and features and drop downs and stuff. And the UI is different a little bit. But in essence, they all pretty much work the same way. They all give you a spectrum scope. They all give you a waterfall. They all give you uh, a lot of the other typical filters. What's really nice about this is they've done a really pretty good job of giving you some pretty powerful audio filters in here, uh, RF and audio filters, so that you can actually play uh, all kinds of games. And, and if you got a station that's a little bit weak, a little bit off, a little noisy, you can really clean it up quite a bit. It's really amazing. It's just night and day difference. And uh, a kind of capabilities you'll only see on the very high end uh, dedicated HF rigs out there. Uh, and the software is free. And, and the RSP1A is, I think, 125 bucks today from uh, Ham Radio Outlet. So it's a great way to add, breathe new life into an older rig. Uh, you know, if you've got one of the Kenwood 450 uh, SATs uh, or anything of that uh, generation, uh, an ICOM 730, something like that, great solid radio. But it doesn't have any of the spectrum scope. It has very little display at all on it. Uh, and it doesn't have, of course, these features. It's a great way to dramatically up your game very inexpensively and be able to see things. Uh, you can be having a QSO. And then here's a cool thing. Here's another cool feature. The uh, software is running on a PC. So what I do is I have a Bluetooth uh, ear plug in my right ear. And I use a single ear headphone with a boom mic on my left ear. That is that boom mic is listening to my transceiver. Okay, and I talk on that. But the Bluetooth uh, earplug that I have in my right ear is listening to the uh, SDR software off the PC through Bluetooth. So I can be listening to and be hunting around on the band for what's happening while I'm either listening to the response of the guy I'm talking to or talking to him, I can have that conversation and still be scoping out the rest of the band at the same time without having to retune. I can see all the activity. So there's all kinds of games like that you can play once you split that function of receive and control over the receive using SDR and software against your transceiver. So uh, that's kind of a really, really quick upshot of the whole concept of uh, rece uh, diversity receive and SDR. So with that, I'm gonna throw it open to questions. Anybody have questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I Rudy. do, Rudy. Hey, go Rudy. Ahead. Uh, go ahead. Oh, me? Oh. Yeah, Steve, go. Okay, if you go to the uh, one that says popular SDR, Hardware. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Let me go to that. This one. Now, when you talk about the frequency range, it's a little unclear because the one that's the best at the bottom discovery uh, that says nine to 31 megacycles or what is that range <laughs> there? Oops. Typo. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's nine kilohertz at 30, oh, 31 gigahertz. Three, three point, I'm sorry, that's a typo. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. I should yeah, have I mean, you could, that you, might have been. You can look that up, but thanks for catching that. Yeah, but it is a wide, very wide range, in other words. It's not. Uh, uh, it's, it's a huge range. It looks like yeah, the sampling that's what I rate. Thought. The yeah. sampling rate is way up there. The bit depth is way up there. It's a, it's a you know, it, it, it's a deluxe unit. Yeah, that's what I thought it would yeah. look like. The other thing I meant I didn't mention uh, in the presentation is that there's other uh, 
flavors of the SDR play. Uh, there's the RSP Duo, which actually has two antenna inputs and has two channels output on a single USB port. So it's two radios in one, basically. So you can be monitoring two completely different spectrums like CB, uh, FRS, uh, airband, whatever, and uh, be, be monitoring that while you're monitoring 20 meters or something. So, uh, okay, great. Other comments or questions? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Okay, uh, yeah, Rudy, I just wanted to answer your question. Uh, with the uh, advent of AI, I'm thinking now in particular of where you're listening to a receive-only antenna, say a beverage, with your SDR, and then you have your uh, transceiver on a more conventional antenna, uh, the propagation may vary so that one is better than the other for receive, and it goes back and forth. Uh, is there software available, or will there be, that will enable sort of like voting software on a repeater that will uh, uh, combine or create the best signal for multiple antennas for uh, maximum intelligibility? Are you following what I'm talking about? I totally follow what you're talking about, and you actually, Craig, uh, I'll give you uh, I'll give you points for that because you anticipated my special little appendix presentation tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking about AI. I'm going to be talking about the future of where this is all leading, because this whole concept has set the stage for a complete new revolution in ham radio, and I mean revolution and it's a revolution i think ham radio operators are going to like so uh, but we'll talk about that here in a minute but i want to get through uh, uh some of the material that i've already presented and that we're talking about just on the basics of the diversity mode and the rationale and how to set it up and how to use it thank you you bet we'll be back to you on that craig so other questions or comments uh yeah rudy i got two questions uh number one you said there were a lot of software packages are those software packages compatible with any of the sdrs or does the sdrs need their own specific software package well uh i will tell you it's kind of a, a little bit of both ron um uh, many of these software packages will support multiple hardware and they will usually support the most popular hardware including those three that i pointed out all of these packages will support all three of those devices, those hardware devices I showed you. Um, once you get out of that range, uh, it starts to drop off which packages support which units. You need something, sometimes you need something called an uh, uh, EXTIO uh, driver that you have to load. No big deal, just download that. Uh, but many of them are just literally plug and play uh, to the USB um, and will recognize the USB straight away. Uh, so the answer is the ones I'm showing you now are compatible with uh, the three hardware units I showed you, plus uh, many of the other ones. Uh, I, I deliberately did not want to talk about the trans transceiver style, like the Lime SDR or the Hack RF style or the uh, 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 Radio Berry, which is also a transceiver, a very low power transceiver. Uh, because that, that already gets into a different class of devices. But uh, I just want to talk about getting into this at a very practical level. Um, so what was your other question, Ron? Okay, I was a little bit confused, uh, at least in the beginning, uh, with the use of the term SDR, because originally I thought SDR, I thought most transceivers are now SDR. Uh, you know, I've read that uh, 7300 is an SDR, Yep. Yeah, this is something different than the transceiver, so it's kind of confusing. No. Okay, so uh, so to be clear, you're absolutely right. Uh, they are starting to use software-defined DSP processes and dedicated chips in many of the latest radios, like the 7300. Uh, and so, yes, the 7300 actually has an SDR receiver built into it. Uh, of course, the transceiver has some DSP chips for the audio processing and, and uh, forming the RF signal. Uh, so it could be a, an SDT, if, you, if you'll pardon the pun, um, uh, a software-defined transmitter. All right. So it's kind of a combination of both. But 
the idea that a standalone SDR is a couple of missions. One, it's a great way to get people excited in a whole new way about SWL, shortwave listening, and ham radio listening, copying code, uh, listening to QSOs, listening how contests work so that when you actually want to jump in and participate, you're not freaked out. You understand how, how the rap goes in a contest because it moves very fast. So uh, things like that, and uh, for for very cheap, right? Um, and uh, to augment older radios, and to give you a whole new uh, um, window on your entire band in great detail and great resolution, while you're sitting there on one frequency on a QSO. So it, it's a even with the seventy three hundred. Um, uh, I know there's guys in the club who are using the SDRs for augmenting their 7300. And they love it. They absolutely love it because for those reasons and some others. So uh, before we go to some other questions, before I forget, there was one more point I wanted to make. And that was, uh, it had to do with um, TR switches. Yeah. Uh, I have found, interestingly enough, that uh, this Banggood, TR switch, which its design is pretty good. They, uh, they're they not all that reliable, so you better test the heck out of it when you get it to make sure that it works. If it works, it'll probably work for you forever, and they're cheap. They're like 45 bucks. But the cool thing about this is not only does it uh, switch your uh, antenna on the RF, it'll also switch your audio. Now, this is really pretty cool because with one headset, while you're transmitting, you could configure it to listen to and in monitor mode, for example, to hear the quality of your audio going out. And then when you release the push to talk switch, it goes to receive mode, listens to your receive antenna, and you can have a, a pretty good receive and hear what's going on through your uh, from uh, coming out of your PC into this box and it, it uh, plays that source through your same headsets so that's a pretty cool feature but i did find a way to set this up so that you can actually have two separate antennas going to two separate radios so in other words a diversity mode receive only antenna a dedicated transmit antenna into one tr switch hooked up to a second tr switch kind of back to back whose output goes in receive mode goes to the SDR and in transmit goes, hooks up to the your transceiver for the output to the appropriate. And so you get it set up right. They can, it's like a crossbar switch. You can actually set it up so it'll cross over. So I wanted you guys to realize that um, that, that is definitely doable because that's what I do here in the shack. Well, so with that, questions, questions and comments. Uh, if I could, Rudy, I, I just want to clear up a little bit something um, that actually uh, the 7300 is an SDR transmitter also. Right. Now, just so you know, Ron, the, the big difference is it isn't using transistors and everything to figure out all the um, transmission. It uses software to do that. One reason that, that the receive uh, SDR radios are cheap is because their processors are smaller and, and not as expensive. To, to put a, uh, that into transmit mode, you do need a more powerful uh, uh, tra uh, transistor or um, uh, uh, the circuit that is used for that is all handled by software. So the software that is running on your machine which is actually now a computer instead of a radio. It is actually processing all of your, your information and then running it out the RF. It still has an RF back end, but what's doing all the work is the software. That's why uh, that's, you know, the, the flex radio that I've got, the, the 6400. It is um, all designed specifically around the processors that they use and they put into it. And then, of course, the software is built to that. And it'll actually run any kind of software. It likes the one that, of course, they designed for Flex Radio, which is, um, you know, what do they call that, SDR? Um, 
God, I forgot. <laughs> it has its own name. Uh, oh, and, there's a bunch of them, 6,600, 6,700, all yeah, those. They all use the same software. And it's, um, uh, it, it, it isn't something that, um, how do I want to put it? Uh, it is a complete difference. And of course, um, they make the, the radios look like real radios sometimes, uh, but they actually aren't. What's inside are these boards that just, you know, it's a big, big difference. But it's all software controlled. Of course, you do need a computer to run them or they build the computer into it. And that they, they do that where they have your own screen on it and everything. My 6400, I run right on the same screen that I'm looking at right now. And uh, it works just fantastic. So let me follow up with that with a little more information for you guys. Uh, Charlie's absolutely right. And the software that runs inside the, the radio uh, and runs the CPU is actually called firmware. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do a firmware update, that's what you're doing is you're updating the software that the chips run on. Now, some of these DSP chips and some of these radios are actually what's called an FPGA, a field programmable gate array. And they do have the capability, although they usually don't give it to you, uh, if it's FPGA based, there is the capability of flashing new logic into a new DSP. In other words, upgrade the actual DSP logic chip itself that does the heavy lifting. Uh, and uh, update the FPGA and reprogram those gates and rewire it inside, essentially, and create a, essentially a new DSP chip. And they can do that on the receive side or the transmit side. But most of these radios don't give you that option. And very many of them don't even have uh, very many or frequent firmware updates either, as I think most of us realize. Uh, certainly not as frequently updated as, for example, the Zygo 6100. The 6100 updates come out on that every like every quarter or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so because it's a fully uh, software defined transceiver um, or what I'll call an SDX. Uh, if it's SDR for a software defined radio, I'll call it an SDX for software defined transceiver. So um, so that's a great example, by the way, of a software defined transceiver is a little 6100. Uh, the 705. Uh, is very much the same kind of a radio, same class of radio. And I think the uh, the uh, Elecraft KX3 and KX4 are also software-defined radios. So that's, the, that's kind of the trend. But uh, as I'll show you here in a minute, there we have a long way to go to, uh, to get to where I think uh, ham radio will, will be at a whole new plane, at a whole, whole new world. Oh, but... Uh, yeah, Rudy. Yeah. Um, I, one more question. Uh, you were talking about yeah. the uh, uh, the receive transmit switches that right. switch off uh, the SDR if you've got a regular uh, transceiver. Um, I, in the past, when I've used my um, dongles with a regular radio, I would have a separate antenna uh, that would be um, at least twenty five feet away from my transmit antenna. It, well, right. my uh, transceiver antenna, which at that time was not an SDR. Uh, but I would have, uh, say, um, my uh, uh, two on uh, the SDR, and uh, I would have a separate antenna just to receive. And it was always amazing how well I could hear on the SDR side. And then when I go over to transmit on that same frequency, um, yep. it, it was, I would have a lot more noise. Yep. And I didn't have the filters on a standard, uh, you know, portable transceiver like a, a my 817 or well, the 891, I could filter out a lot of stuff, but um, uh, it was absolutely amazing the difference in the sound. Absolutely true, Charlie. Uh, that's, a, that's a good example. Yeah. And then also on the switch, you mentioned something about uh, one was a voltage and one was, um, I got confused on that when you were talking about the switches. Okay, so uh, I think I know what you're talking about, Charlie, is how do you trigger switching from transmit to receive? Right. How do you switch the relay inside? Okay, generally, uh, there are there are usually two inputs to these beasts. One is the is to use the RF signal itself with a small um, ferrite that and coil that picks up the RF, senses that, and drives that to switch the relay. 
I don't prefer that because if your if your power is low for some reason, or if there's any issue with your coax or anything, and it's not driving it properly, it may not switch. A much more surefire way is to wire up the push to talk output. Uh, now, okay. what I what I did since your push to talk switch. Uh, on your your radios are just a switch closure. They're right. all just a simple switch closure. You can actually wire that in parallel to the input, the push to talk input of these SDR of the excuse me these uh, TR switches, and uh, that's what I do. And so now some radios do have a dedicated push to talk output, which is not the same as the push to talk input. The push to talk input switch closure is a command input to the radio to go to transmit mode. The uh, And very often you'll have the same input on the back jack. Uh, some radios will have that. Uh, other radios will actually have a push to talk output, mm -hmm. which will close a switch uh, as an output when the push to talk is hit and uh, they can drive something like the TR switch. So uh, the easiest thing is just hook it up in parallel with a little Y connector uh, to the uh, to your micro or to your push to talk switch input, so uh, hopefully that clarifies it. Yeah, it does. Thank you. But the um, MFJ switch that a lot of people are buying uh, mm -hmm. if if they're using an SDR on the side. Yep. Um, and uh, that is not using the the push to talk. It senses right. You know, I haven't looked at this, but I suspect that either aux or control up here is that push to talk input i suspect that's what it is ah uh, okay because that's an rca plug that's just a two-liner yeah yeah well, when i realized this thing was well over 100 bucks and this one over here on the right was 45 guess which one i got <laughs> yeah the 45 yeah <laughs> right exactly so uh and it's got more features so <laughs> you just have to test the hell out of it when it comes to make sure that it isn't a piece of junk when it comes and that it actually works but you know that's a coin toss Yep. All right. But uh, I know uh, I and another guy uh, bought one and uh, didn't work no matter what we tried. And uh, we got our money back and they just said, keep it. So one of these <laughs> days, I'll, one of these days, I'll just tear it apart and debug it and I'll, I'll get it working, too. So but but the design itself is nice. It's small and it's uh, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty versatile. All right, so we're about at the halfway point, guys. Um, any other questions or comments on the presentation or on the concepts of SDR and diversity received in general? Uh, I got one more. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. yeah, I think when you're talking about the SDR software, let's say if you're really just focused on HF only, you're not looking at 300 kilohertz or... Yep two megahertz or two gigahertz, I should say. Is there any particular software that stands out in terms of, maybe it doesn't make any difference, but again, just looking at HF operating, one particular uh, free software that you'd recommend? Well, it's it, Steve, it's not so much the bands, it's more targeted towards the users. And for example, uh, SDR console, has a lot of features and functions specifically targeted and tuned for ham operators, as opposed to CB and FRS and aviation and stuff like that. Right? They've got all the bands predefined, as, as you know, and snap, and you get the whole band. Uh, they've got sub bands already predefined, things like that. So I like SDR console myself. That I look, I played with all of them. I loaded them all. I tried them all. And some of them were a little goofy. Some of them were not terribly intuitive. Um, and SDR console for ham radio operation, overall, I like the best personally. But uh, hey, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So any anything else uh, before we wrap on this conversation and move on to this auxiliary conversation I'd like to have with you all? Okay, all right, so none heard. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make a, a statement. And that is, I think the that the mindset of modern ham radio operators have been shifting over the decades. 
from experimenters, builders, craftspeople, often out of necessity, more towards appliance users and appliance operators, cell phones and, you know, all this other stuff has trained us to expect appliances that just work and just do what we want them to do. And ham radio and ham radio operators, I don't think is any different. Uh, you can always build stuff and accessories around it, but the radio itself, if everybody had to build their own transceiver from scratch in order to get on the air, very few of us would be on the air today, okay, if we had to do it today. Uh, a lot of people don't have the time, the patience, the knowledge, the support, etc. So with that said, I asked myself, what is the future of ham radio in general? And in particular, what is the future that all of this SDR radio and firmware and software coming together lays the groundwork for? Where is this taking us? Where is this foundation? What is the house possibly going to look like when it can be built on this foundation? And I want to make a statement right now, and I want to share this with you. Okay? I'm going to make a bold statement about the future of ham radio operations. Can you all see that? Yep. And I would say it's all about making the transition from procedure-based operations to intention-based operations with the help of conversational AI that learns your preferences and how best to please you. That is what I think we're going to be moving towards, is AI-based radio, where AI is actually built into the radio. So let's take a look at what I think is the evolution of ham radio equipment. We started off with hardware-defined radios, radios that we've had forever, right? No waterfall, no nothing. All you had was a frequency readout and, uh, and an S meter reading. Then we moved to software defined receivers like we've been talking about tonight, SDR and software. And then the world started moving into software defined transceivers like what Charlie has with the, uh, the Flex series of radios. Well, where do we go from there? I believe the next logical step will be to add AI to these software-defined receivers, initially in the computer. And so you'll see plugins happen. For all of these SDR software packages, you'll see AI plugins that will be AI assistants. And eventually they'll apply that to transceivers with SDI assistants, okay? And then finally, finally, the ultimate, is a direct brain to radio interface. Yeah, I know you're going to think that's crazy, but you know, think of a Bluetooth chip to your brain that's paired to your, your PC uh, with an AI running on it and uh, uh, hooked up to also to your radio. So, uh, and eventually all this stuff is going to be built right into any of the hardware boxes that you have uh, and integrated. So, so Rudy... Are yeah. you telling me that Alexa will live in my radio now? Oh, it's going to be way scarier than that. It, well, I should say it's going to be way more exciting to some and way scarier to others. Uh, the real trick is how to contain it, how to manage it, how to, uh, uh, what's the word? I guess manage it, all right? Mm -hmm. Um and and how to have the tools to help you manage it so that's not a runaway situation where you know <laughs> uh, so ham, ham radio, radio I, yeah ham radio is going to be a little bit behind just like they have been with the cell phone uh because now the smart tvs all you have to do is talk to it yeah you don't even have to go up or down on the channels you just say give me nbc and boom it's there yep. um uh, uh tell me what i've recorded boom it's there uh, so yep. now if I had a if I had my 6400 programmed, I could just say, OK, I want to do FT9 to, or FT7. Go ahead and set me up and I want to go to these bands and uh, off it would go. Well, let's take a look. I have postulated four different pages, OK, mm -hmm. that you can imagine on your screen. OK, whether it's on the radio or it's on your laptop or whatever, it's on your screen. 
So what you're not seeing on the screen is all the spectrum, all these filters, all these hundreds of buttons. And by the way, all these dozens and dozens and dozens of knobs and buttons that you have on classical radios, same thing. They all, they all go away because those are procedures you have to, to you know have to hunt around listening for a guy calling CQ you have to tune him up then you have to you know wait until he's finished and you call him and and you hope that he hears you blah blah you go through this whole rap over and over and over again you won't do that anymore mm -hmm. so i'm going to give you four i'm going to tell you about four pages i envision okay analysis page contact page qso page and contesting page, just to start with, all right? So let's take a look at what you can see on the analysis page. You'll have two sections. You'll have a band analysis and you'll have propagation analysis, all right? In the band analysis, it's gonna give you a list of stations by band and by mode, all right? So for example, you, you'll talk to it. Remember, this is all conversational. You won't click on anything, you won't twiddle a knob. You won't push a button. You'll say you'll say something like, Yezu, wake up. Yes, sir. What would you like today? And you'll tell it like Alexa, but you'll tell it the intention. All right. Not you won't give it a command. You'll tell it the intention. You'll say, what are the bands doing today? And it'll do a full scan. All right. And it will make a list of who's on. It'll give it to you in decreasing signal strength. It'll give it to you by mode, by band, by frequency range, whatever you want, okay? It'll give it to you even by, uh, by state, by country, however you want to filter it. It'll identify the caller. It'll do uh, speech to text to code to back to speech again, encoding and decoding. So if you want to talk CW, you'll literally have a conversation and say, send that out by by CW and it'll do it. If you want to have a conversation FT8, you'll simply tell it, have a, you know, send an F, this, the standard FT8 message and you'll click on this one or you'll tell it FT8 message three and it'll transmit FT8 message three if you want, or you'll just say default. And uh, so you'll have this conversation. It'll also do propagation analysis. All right. It'll tell you what are the current band conditions? What's the forecast for upcoming band conditions so I know when to come back and get back on the air because the band conditions now kind of stink. So you can also have uh, the output, the, the condition report also sorted and filtered by band, signal strength, noise, time of day, state, country, region. You can slice and dice it. And in the meantime, this thing's in the background doing all the work for you behind the scenes, crunching, scanning. You know. If you look at how a reverse beacon network works, you can see a little tiny uh, 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 glimpse of this. It's actually collecting and constantly uh, accumulating all the uh, reports from all these SDR radios. That's what they've got hooked up through special software that automatically reports the signal strength and the call sign, et cetera, of the CW test call in the CW portion of the band on all the bands and reports them to a single database. Well, instead of a single database on the web, this database is in your laptop, in your software. And it'll actually sit there and collect all this information and sort it out. And it'll present it to you, okay, as a screen full of, of options. You know, if you're in your car, for example, and you say, call, you know, Joe Blow, and Joe Blow's got three different phone numbers, your car talks back to you and says, say which phone number you want, one, two, or three. And you say number two, and it dials... Uh, number two that's the way it's going it's in our cars now it's going to be in ham radio just a, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when right and i think this would be fantastic for ham radio and i personally would like it now let's go to the contacts page contacts page all right you uh you click on the current contact all right uh it'll it, it can sort all the other people uh, in that band who are in, for example, the sideband portion of the band. Uh, it'll give you their signal strength and the noise floor uh, that you're listening to. Them. Uh, it'll tell them, it'll tell you whether there's any matches in terms of their state, their country, um, you know, their, have you talked to them before, etc. And then uh, if you hover on that, it'll give you a voice description all about them. Uh, in the target context, You'll have color coded. It'll tell you 
uh, the, their state is if it's on your W uh, work all states list, if it's on your hot list, if it's your, on your hot list for DXCC, if it's a POTUS soda contact, QRP mobile portable contact, if it's an emergency Aries Racy's contact, or if it's uh, in your sorted or filtered contact log, and you've talked to this guy before, and you want it to automatically bring him up, show you his last contact, when it was, what frequency it was on, and you call back and say, Eric, haven't talked to you since last April. You know, how you been? And it, it'll make you very intelligent sounding. So all of this is, is fairly straightforward, but the key is it's all conversational now with the help of some lists and some uh, uh, voice commands, all right? Or you can click on them or you can have a voice command, you know, um, send message number two, that sort of thing. Then you go to the QSO page, all right? You can either launch a, a CQ or a QRZ call and it'll automatically find you a quiet part of the band. It'll actually say, stand by one second, and it'll scan the band and listen for a nice low noise, quiet portion of the band that's empty right now. And then it'll say, go ahead. And then, then you can either trigger a standard script or you can uh, uh, click on a station from a list that it hears. Uh, you can see the details, cross check for previous contact, launch a contacts, one of many contact scripts, all right? Like, how are you doing? You know, long time no here, blah, 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 blah. And you can have it insert the details of the last contact. So, you know, nice to talk to you, Eric, since we haven't spoken since last, blah, blah, April. And it'll fill that in for you. Uh, it'll do automatic logging. And uh, it'll also, here's another cool thing. Since you can have this thing scanning in the background for all the other contacts that are going on and all the other people calling CQ on the band at the same time, you want to grab those guys. So it'll continue updating your list of all the people calling CQ. And in fact, while you're waiting to hear back from the first guy, you can actually tell it to go call uh, and respond to a CQ call to the second guy. And you can go back and forth and switch back and forth. Uh, I mean, it's crazy stuff like that. It, it makes possibilities. And then finally, the contact contest page. You can find open frequencies near where most traffic is. It turns out that there are strategies when you're contesting. If you ever talk to a contester, they all have their strategies, right? They'll go scanning up in the band and there'll be places where, you know, DX clusters, uh, well, this is contact clusters. Uh, there'll be groups of people in a certain portion of the band that all hang around at the same place calling QRZ or CQ contest, and uh, they'll all be in this kind of a cluster. So it'll find that those clusters for you, and it'll find an open frequency closest to that cluster, and then you can launch a, a synthesized contact, uh, contest script, or you can list the stations by signal strength, and uh, noise ratio, cross-check for previous contacts to make sure you, it's not a dupe. Um, you can launch the contest script, automatic log them, and then update the band analysis in real time and highlight the next opportunity that you should go after. And you'll be able to go through contacts really, really, really fast with, and, and I have, this is what I put together in about an hour this afternoon is some of these crazy ideas. I'm sure there's gonna be a whole bunch of other ideas that can happen, but the crazy thing is it's all gonna be in software and it's all gonna be conversational and it's all gonna make, it's gonna make ham radio a, a it won't eliminate the human factor. It amplifies the human factor. I want to make that a good point. Uh, it, it's not like replacing the operator with a computer. It's it's just putting the human operator on in a huge armchair with a whole bunch of voice-operated buttons on it, kind of like Kirk and the Starship Enterprise. And he's got his command chair there, and he just sits back and he just looks and talks. Uh, so and gives commands right to his to his crew. Well, the AI is going to be his, his uh, faithful crew. So with that, I want to throw the discussion uh, open to, for you to tell me if you think I'm crazy or not. Oh, I don't think you're crazy, Rudy. I think uh, you've hit it right on the button. That's pretty close to what's going to happen. The problem is, is Yezu, Icom, Kenwood, and all the Chinese companies going to be able to do this? Uh, do they want to put their money in it unless they do AI first in the commercial side, which they probably will. 
because all of these things are exactly what they're looking at to do on the commercial side. Motorola sure. did it years ago, uh, you know, with with putting everything on the, you know, uh, where you hear the beep, beep, beep on the radio because the band is busy. And then when it leads up, you can talk and that sort of thing. And that, you know, it's I just can't wait until I talk to Yoda yes, Yesu on my uh uh, you know, my 891 and yeah. uh, he comes back at me and says uh, at uh, 24 point, you know, it, it is clear tonight. I just uh, th that that would make sense. But the problem is, is are those companies going to put all of that money into AI to do that first? Or are we going to get the tail end? That that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Now, I would ask you this. Um, you see all these progress is happening in smartphones. OK, yes. now, granted, the smartphone market is thousands of times bigger than the ham radio market oh, ever will be. Millions okay? of times bigger. <laughs> but but the fact is that they've set the precedent, done all the heavy lifting. Yes, there's going to be so much A.I. out there, application specific tools to build your own API or your own A.I. with an API built into an application peripheral interface that you can tune to ham radio fairly quickly and then embed into these new class of radio. So what you need is a platform that can receive it, that can plug into it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think you're gonna see the transition be, the AI will live in your PC, just like the software does today. The AI will enhance the PC software. It will start displacing all of these fancy displays and, and spectrum scopes and all waterfalls all that stuff is you get it's going to look like a model t ford yeah okay um and it's going to show you lists of stuff and it's going to show you graphics and of contacts around the world it's going to show you maps it's going to show you graphical things it's going to be a, a, a really interesting world and who are going to be the leaders i think that's what you're asking and i think mm -hmm. i don't see the classic radio guys because they're radio guys they're not ham radio appliance guys they're fundamentally radio guys they know how to build radio equipment now they might have the basic radio equipment but they're not going to be able to provide the whole thing it's guys like flex radio it's guys like expert electronics with the sun sdr2 dx and the expert mm -hmm. electronics uh, mv1 okay guys who are leading the pack on a new generation a completely new generation of of paradigm for making ham radio an appliance okay. and, and i suspect there'll be others so i think we're going to see a transition with ai being applied through your laptop to your hardware and it'll control the the rig as best it can but it's still going to at some point it's going to run out of capabilities it won't be able to do the full tilt boogie like i was describing to you it's going to have limits limited basically by the cat commands that are available in the radio which can't do everything right uh for example it uh, unless you've got a separate uh which some of the fancier radios do they give you a separate ability to extract the i and q signals which is the the well, decoded signals broadband which is what you see on the spectrum scope of these uh, software defined software. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you have access to that and give that access to the AI and not all radios have that only the very upper end radios uh, or you add an SDR receiver. All, it, all it's going to take is a programmer to do it. That's how we came yep. up with all the software that is available for the, for the original chip, which came out of Europe for the TV controller, like you were talking about. And all they did was write software to do that, just like they did for controlling yep. a TV, but they did it for controlling exactly. the bands because it would accept the broad range of receive on the bands. Yep. And then the transmitting side, they just reversed that and created the software that would go through. They just needed bigger processors. And that was Exactly. Worked. Exactly. So, so Craig has his hand up and he's been, been very, very quiet out there in Alaska. <laughs> well, that's all right. Yeah, uh, a couple of uh, points, uh, uh, and you touched on this at the very beginning of uh, the AI part, and that is the people right off the bat who are the most needy for this type of technology are those who don't have the full capability that all the people on the screen do. So as uh, many of you know, Linda, W7SPA, she's a member of the club, 
And uh, assuming that uh, uh, we're on track for the normal meeting in October, I will be driving her over because we finish up with this uh, electronics convention outside DC and I'll be headed your way, off topic. Any rate, uh, I've been working with Linda and Candy Ham. That is the group that uh, represents uh, disabled amateurs, and uh, they have quite a, uh, a package of AI-related software and developmental material. And it's worth your time to uh, uh, talk to Handy Ham or uh, or go look at their website to see what they're working on because they're cool. at the point of the spear right now because they're people, uh, in one sense or another, are the neediest. If you're following what I'm saying. Okay. Yep. The other part of this is, and many of you received this, I just sent this out earlier today, and that is the precise location of Malaysian Airlines MH370 oh, yeah. off the uh, coast of Australia and uh, and How Antarctica. did Mr. Taylor get involved in that? Uh, yeah, Joe Taylor. Uh, he's my yeah. hero. So uh, uh, actually, that uh, if you read that 232-page report, or at least go to the executive summary, you'll see how the whisper technology was used because those were public records of all of the uh, uh, reception that has happened uh, uh, since way before that airplane disappeared. And they had some information from the, uh, uh, FedEx, the uh, engine pingers that were transmitting every hour. Well, now using whisper technology, they've been able to track it down. Well, mm -hmm. subsequent to that, uh, after I got uh, through with saying nice things about Joe Taylor, and if you look at the report, it talks about how AI is used uh, to decipher these mountains of reports that came in from all over the world to figure out exactly what the path of the aircraft is. And of course, on about the third or fourth page of that, it shows the track, and that was all done by AI. So wow. anybody who hasn't received that, uh, give me your email in the chat, and I'll forward it on to you. But uh, that's uh, that's the news from today. That came out uh, four days ago in the public record in that. Uh, there's uh, ships that are being organized right now to go to the site because uh, uh, the AI using whisper reception has pinned down the location of the uh, second most desirable lost aircraft in the world yeah. uh, within a few meters. So I expect resolution of that shortly. Back do you think you. we could do that with Amelia Earhart's airplane? Uh, I don't think that Whisper existed before 2000. Oh, no, shucks. Uh, yeah, shucks. So, well, I weren't those people back at the, the Halicrafters and Collins days doing all this stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, Craig, thanks for that. As a matter of fact, you, you uh, trigger a thought, and that is one of the really interesting aspects of the, uh, uh, diversity received in STR is you can very often be picking up signals that are below the uh, signals threshold of a typical receiver. Yes. And, and by typical American receiver, I mean all but the very high end. There are some high end radios out there that can that can do some amazing things, but uh, you can pick up signals on your SDR radio that very often you won't hear on your regular transceiver like a 7300, even though it has a pretty decent receiver. So um, Whisper, is pretty cool because it listens to digital stuff at very, very low power. I mean, they're, they're sometimes putting out ridiculously low power, a couple hundred milliwatts. On the appropriate antenna with a good receive antenna, you can get those things. So um, anyway, I this is my vision for seeing how it all can come together. And I think what you're seeing here with SDR and receive is is laying the groundwork for the the evolution of ham radio into what I think is a, is a pretty cool appliance. Comments, and boy, and boy, did you hit the top of the hour right on cue, Rudy? Okay. <laughs> Before we wrap, are there any other questions or comments that you guys have? Or I think I we just, kind of I think we just blew the minds of a couple <laughs> guys out there, Rudy. Okay. Well, I mean, that's half the fun. I like blowing people's minds. Yeah. So the, uh, the, Anyway, um, so that's uh, that's pretty much it for today. So, Rudy, our next uh, your next uh, um, podcast on YouTube is I had it written down. What did I do with it? Oh, here we go. It's oh, you're right. Yeah, near vertical incidents, uh, Skywave uh, antennas, NVIS. Yep. Very good. And you're building one, I understand. I'm building an NVIS 40 meter slot antenna. That's a roll up. And well, hopefully gonna... we'll see that in the video. 
Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, it could be the time. <laughs> the time it could work out. If not, I'll bring it to the next meeting. Uh, okay. If it works, if it works. I mean, this, I'm I'm kind of pushing the envelope here, <laughs> right yeah. into the into the corner. So it'll be fun to see. But I've got all the I've got all the the tools to be able to figure it out. So if it can work. I'll make it work because I think it's I think it'd be really cool. Go out there. Well, I'm looking really... forward to NVIS because um yep. as I mentioned to you earlier, I in my mind I still have a little problem understanding NVIS. Oh, okay. Which should be okay, but uh cool. Uh, sometimes well, I you know, I just don't like laying down on the floor. Yeah. It was uh <laughs> It was kind of new to me, and I thought to myself, "What's the point?" And then I started looking into it, and there's a very good point to it. Yeah, it it, it fills a huge gap in uh, HF propagation that is uh, pretty actually pretty easy to fill, uh, it, as long as you follow a few rules uh, guidelines. So Beautiful. we'll talk about that. We'll talk about examples. We'll talk Excellent. about. Uh, uh, who uses it and why and how they use it, how they deploy it, and some other fun and interesting things. So, all right. Back Excellent. You, Thank you very much, Rudy. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us this evening. I hope you had a nice holiday and we'll see you all at the next uh, uh, meeting uh, in a couple of weeks, actually, two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, no. What is today? Monday. Two weeks from Wednesday, uh, we'll have our general meeting. So on that note, everybody have a great week. And thank you, Rudy. And catch you all later. Bye bye. 73. Thanks, 73. Oh, 73. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Rudy.